All right. I think we just took a quick, quick break there because we're running a bit ahead of schedule. But now that you're on, I can uh, hand it over to you for our next talk. Sure. I, I just saw your email that there's awkward silence when we started. <laughs> so, uh, hello everyone. Um, my name is Scott Simpson, director of the Parks and Recreation Division, uh, South Dakota Game Fish and Parks. Uh, just a little quick background here, uh, because I failed to send Casey my bio, and otherwise I'm sure she would have done a, a much better job than I than introducing myself. But uh, uh, I, I'm, I've been with the department for about 17 years. Uh, I, I came to the Wildlife Division uh, in 2004 and uh, began in the licensing department, came from private industry. My background is in the in the uh, private business side of the world was uh, in uh, um, distribution and, and uh, some of those kinds of things, operations management, and uh, came over to the wildlife department and started doing licensing and moved my way uh, to various different uh, uh, areas, ended up supervising uh, GIS and uh, federal aid and information education uh, involved with construction of uh, Outdoor Campus West. Um, just uh, various different administrative functions, uh, including some capital development and budgeting. Uh, two years ago, I was asked to uh, jump over to the park side and uh, lead the parks division, which uh, interestingly enough, it, it took a switch to the parks division to get an invite to the Wildlife Society meeting, which I guess that's, uh, that's, uh, that's fantastic. I'm happy to be here, however I got here. But uh, Anyway, I, I think uh, that's that's enough about myself. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been with the Parks Division for a couple of years now, and uh, just uh, I, I feel like I'm starting to get my feet underneath me, um, learning uh, basically a new profession, uh, although I have been familiar, uh, obviously, with a little bit of the, what Parks Operations looks like. Um, I guess the topic that I was given today was to talk about what our response has been to COVID-19 and, and maybe some of those lessons learned. Um, I don't know if I can fill 20 minutes with that, but uh, if, if I can't, uh, obviously I'd, I'd look forward to any questions that, that you folks might have. Um, I'm gonna start from the beginning here a little bit and, and just talk about uh, you know, what we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, how we reacted to it, and ultimately maybe some of those lessons learned uh, as we moved along. Uh, I, you know, I, I guess you know, just like everyone else, uh, GFP saw, Saw this thing starting to break loose the first part of March. Um, we ended up, uh, you know, basically all of us moving home in uh, the middle of March there. And uh, um, we immediately saw a panic uh, throughout the not just South Dakota parks, but nationwide parks as to how we were going to handle um, our, our upcoming summer. Uh, many states closed down entirely, uh, basically shut down all of their facilities. Um, some some stayed closed uh, throughout a majority of the summer. Um, many of them made some modifications to, to try to allow some participation. Um, I guess the, what, what I'm proud of is that uh, we made the decision to stay open. And not only did we just stay open, uh, we actually uh, eliminated the park entrance license requirement um, through the middle of May, from middle of March to middle of May. Uh, we did this um, just to make sure that we were providing people an opportunity to get outdoors in a time when they needed to be outdoors. It was one of the places that, you know, as we had internal conversations, uh, we, we, we realized quickly that um, being cooped up on top of each other with no place to go uh, was not the best way to deal with uh, the, the pandemic, pandemic situation that we were in. So ultimately, uh, yeah, we waived the waived park entrance licenses. Uh, we immediately saw folks uh, using our trail systems and, and those kinds of things, just getting outdoors um, to have a little break from uh, the, the issues that we were seeing at the time. Uh, we went through that till about the middle of May. Um, saw all kinds of visitation, but uh, you know, sooner or later we had to we had to start making uh, some decisions on how we were going to start uh, moving through our summer. Um, so we, we went back to uh, the, the requirement for the park entrance license. Um, we were starting to move into what our camping season would have been. And uh, immediately, Im immediately we're faced with another challenge where we saw uh, unprecedented uh, 
cancellations for camping trips. Uh, we didn't know what was going to what that was going to look like for the rest of the summer, but we knew right away that we were seeing sometimes upwards of 100, 150,000, 200,000 dollars worth of cancellations in any given week. You know that that immediately made us push the pause button. Uh, you know what, what? How are we going to handle this uh, when, when you know we've taken taken people's money 90 days to a, a year ahead of time, and now they're asking for it back? And in some cases, uh, we have uh, actually spent that money. You know, planning to you know summer summer projects and and, and all those other things. Uh, so we immediately pulled back. That was that was the big thing. Is we immediately pulled back. Um, we reduced our seasonal staff by about uh, over the summer uh, of 2020. Uh, we reduced by about 24,000 hours. Um, I, I believe that was, uh, uh, I don't remember the exact equate, what that equaled for uh, FTE, but I believe it was 20, 25 uh, or, or something close to that full time FTE. Um, so uh, we also looked at our projects. Uh, we, we did not uh, go out for projects on about uh, four and a half million dollars worth of road projects that we had scheduled for the year, um, about three point two million dollars worth of preventive maintenance for the year. Uh, we pulled all that back in, a, in an effort to kind of, uh, you know, make sure that we weren't spending dollars that we didn't have in the bank at the time. Get to about a month later, first, uh, you know, middle of June, somewhere in there. And all of a sudden the whole world shows up in South Dakota to go camping. And uh, we had to react to that as well. Um, folks were coming out in, in record numbers, uh, both with visitation and, and, and camping, as that was identified as something that was uh, a safe activity. And uh, we were happy to provide that service, but we had uh, we'd already made some decisions that impacted how it was that we were going to conduct business throughout the summer. It, it really required uh, us to rethink a lot of our full-time positions you know, we didn't we didn't provide much uh, as far as education or interpretive events throughout the summer. Um, we had to reallocate a bunch of that FTE towards just general operations. You know, I at, at, at times I had regional supervisors who were out uh, cleaning bathrooms and and mowing lawns. Where you know most of the time that that that's not going to be the case. I had interpretive folks that were uh, you know doing the same kind of things. They were. Uh, um, you know, we had a, uh, a cleanup effort that needed to happen in one of our areas out in the hills after a tornado. And, and I've got folks from uh, every area of, of work within GFMP or within the parks division that were out there trying to help with that situation. So it really was an all hands on deck kind of a summer. Um, you know, I guess uh, uh, those were the modifications that we made. Um, it wasn't easy. Uh, we don't want to do it again for another summer. We would like to get back to something that looks pretty regular and uh, get people back into their comfort zone. And I, I, and I think we're going to be able to accomplish that this summer. Um, you know, as far as lessons learned from this, um, I think that, uh, you know, we learned that we need to be pretty flexible, uh, that we need to uh, look at each individual uh, FTE that we have and say, uh, you know, what is this the best fit? Uh, I think we've we've learned some of those things. Uh, I think we've also learned a lesson, uh, at least on the park side, and, and I think uh, I, I think it's a department lesson that we need to make sure that we are helping people manage their own experience. Um, so much of what we do is is predicated on a on a stop into an office or a stop by a entrance booth or a personal visit with someone when they arrive at a park. And we've got to do a much better job of letting people manage their own experience to take care of those things ahead of time, to be able to check in, to be able to purchase licenses, to be able to manage reservations uh, on their own time and uh, uh, before they get to the parks. Um, I think that's just going to be something that uh, our public demands. And, and, you know, quite frankly, it's, it's the safest uh, path forward here until we can figure out what uh, what post uh, pandemic looks like. So, um, you know, we've learned learned a lot of those kinds of lessons. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, I guess going back and looking at 2020, um, I, I think that we've got a better appreciation of what the outdoors means to folks. And that's not that's not park and rec specific. That's that includes wildlife and, you know, GFP as a whole, that outdoor recreation is 
back in front of people. Uh, it's top of mind. It is uh, something that um, I, I think we reconnected a, a bunch of folks with maybe some of their childhood experiences, uh, some of those folks that had been away from those kinds of activities for years, came back uh, over this summer and over this fall, uh, whether they were fishing, hunting, uh, hiking a trail, riding a bike, camping, whatever that might be. Um, there was definitely a reconnect for a lot of people. And, and uh, you know, we're looking to kind of build on that momentum. Um, even though it was brought about by a, a really trying situation, one of the, the most trying situations that I've seen in my lifetime, um, there, there is some, some good things that come out of that, and, it, and it's a reconnection to the outdoors. Um, we want to capitalize on that and uh, make sure that we, uh, we provide people with the experience that they would like when they get to state parks, uh, uh, when they're interacting with the wildlife division, when they're interacting with game, fish, and parks in general. Um, that make sure that, you know, we're, we're doing our jobs when they show up. And I, I think that's a, that's a real important uh, uh, job that we have ahead of us is to retain those folks that uh, showed back up this last summer. You know, we're looking uh, this, at least to this summer, um, some of the individuals that I've reached out to and had conversations with, uh, they are looking at a 30% increase in reservations uh, based on where they were at pre-pandemic, you know, last year, February, uh, first part of March. So we're looking at a, a, what we believe is going to be another strong summer. Um, you know, I don't know if we'll get to the numbers that we saw this year, uh, but we're definitely um, going to see a, a, a busy summer as long as Mother Nature uh, uh, cooperates with us. Um, you know, what did, what did that mean for, you know, when I talk about a busy summer, what does that look like? Uh, in 2019, which is a really down year for us, uh, when we had uh, a lot of flooding and poor weather throughout the summer, uh, we handled about 63, 64, or excuse me, 6.3, 6.4 million visitations um, in the park system. Um, last summer, we jumped that to eight point, almost 8.3 million. Uh, so we, we saw about a 30% increase in, uh, in, in just park visitations. Um, at the same time, uh, we, we saw some of those same increases on the on the camping side, um, going from about 320, 310 uh, thousand nights of camping to jumping it to about 380,000. Significant increases, uh, but those increases came on a couple of down years, a couple of years where we saw declines. And uh, to turn that back around, it's, it's an exciting time for those of us in the park division. And uh, we really look forward to trying to uh, enhance that experience, keep those folks coming back, uh, and, and uh, you know, making sure, again, that uh, they have a quality experience when they show up in the parks. So, uh, Casey, I know that that doesn't, you know, take up the, the 20 minutes that uh, I had allocated, um, but I would, I would absolutely love to answer any questions that anybody's got. I, I recognize a lot of names that are on the board here, and, and they know me well, that uh, um, I'm pretty easy to get along with, and uh, if uh, they'd like to ask some questions, I'd be more than happy to, to answer those. Great, thank you so much, Scott. Um, any questions for Scott? Um, if you, actually, if people just wanna unmute themselves to go ahead and ask this time, uh, we were having some issues before with missing some of the chatted questions. So feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask away. I know Runia and Switzer and some of those guys have gotta ask something, I mean, or at least crack a joke, one of the two. <laughs> yeah, Scott, I was going to ask, uh, what's your favorite movie? Ah, uh, wow. <laughs> you know I've got several. Uh, yeah, you weren't, you weren't ready for that one, were you? <laughs> yeah. uh, Caddyshack is right up there. Um, can't, can't beat a, a good Caddyshack, and I think I know every line to that movie. Um, Step Brothers, as I, I know John, you and I have gone back and forth on, on Step Brothers quite a bit. And uh, any, anything I don't have to think too hard about, as you know, I'm not exactly an academic. So um, anything that is just kind of uh, funny and, uh, is, is great by me. So perfect. Appreciate it. Maybe and, I'll throw, and I'll throw Animal House in there too, just because you look like John Belushi. Yeah, I've, I've been told that a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Hopefully somebody with, with a little more witty question thought of one while we were talking. Well, it, it won't take much to top you, John, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Anything else more relevant for Scott? Yeah, so Scott, my last question that I missed because I left too early, um, you hit on some of the same things I did, retention. So can you speak to the park side? How are we gonna retain these folks? Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a great question. It's a it's a, you know even when I was on the wildlife side, that was something that we were working on is how do we retain folks and and I don't know that there's a magic bullet for that. I don't think that uh, anybody's exactly solved that riddle. I think that we start with making sure that folks have a quality experience when they when they get uh, to wherever we want them to be. Right? I don't care if that's a boat ramp or a state park or uh, a game production area or uh, a rec area, wherever that might be. I, I think that's that's the, one of the most Im important things that we can do is that make, make sure that we're meeting their expectations. Um, after that, uh, Heather, I'd take any advice that you've got or, uh, you know, Tanaya and some of those folks that are working on things. But um, I, I, I think that that's, that's our biggest selling point is just making sure that uh, we're we're well prepared when folks to show up to meet their expectations. Um, we've got a powerful tool coming with uh, a one-stop shop where we're able to advertise some additional opportunity to, uh, you know, engage those folks and, and make sure that they're uh, aware of, of all the opportunities that we've got. If we've got uh, openings in parks or at lodges or uh, uh, shoot leftover deer tags or whatever those things are that I, I think we've got a better system coming that will allow us to, advertise those opportunities and hopefully engage folks moving forward. So that, that's a little thing, but uh, I think it goes a long ways, uh, just that communication with our customers. Excellent. Maybe Heather, this would be a good time for you to answer Hillary's question that we missed too, kind of the same thing along retention with the license sales. Yeah, don't fool yourselves, guys. I didn't come up with that question on my own. That was Hillary Mori. Thank you. Um, so, you know, Scott's right. We we've always kind of wondered how do we how do we keep these people, but that's a national question. Again, it's not unique to us. Um, we are really fortunate at South Dakota Game Fish and Parks. We have one of the most talented GIS teams in the country. So over the last year, Kyle Kasky, one of our GIS folks, um, created interactive dashboards for us to use on the hunting fishing licensing side, where we can look at things like churn and retention and reactivation, where we can compare with some of our license sales, not necessarily uh, to pull out specific people, but we can pull out geographic areas to see is there an area where we've specifically lost a lot of small game hunters now that's not necessarily the easiest way to just go in and say well yeah let's get them back you know it does take a lot of research and time to try and figure out why did we lose them but that's an opportunity for us to host educational classes in those areas to work with the schools on things like getting hunt safe in the schools um, but also scott had made a great point that we have a new parks and wildlife one-stop shop system coming. So with that, we're gonna be able to track our users and have more information on what their habits are, not just on the park side, not just on the wildlife side, but them as a whole person recreating in the outdoors. So we can try and uh, create things that are going to be enticing for them. Packages where, you know, if you're going to book a campsite at Farm Island, and you're making sure you want a waterfront campsite, there's the opportunity that our system will check your profile and say, hey, do you want to pick up a fishing license since you're going to be right on the water? So we have opportunities like that that are just on the horizon that I think are going to make a really big difference for our customers. Um, it'll make it easier for them to do business with us. And we're going to be running more like a business and not a, a red tape government agency that I think a lot of us get stuck in that. But I even had um, like Eileen uh, Dowd Stuckel had a really great option that she emailed me on regarding the one-stop shop system. Um, our staff has written a few books. So is there a better way using our one-stop shop programming where we can sell some of these publications and get this information out? And I think that's a great 
out of the box, you know, idea for us to get this information out to the public and really shout from the rooftops. We have an amazing team and a bunch of really smart folks. So the more we can help get their information out, the better. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions for Scott or Heather while we still have them on? We got a chatted question there from uh, Bruce. He's wondering how important mobile apps are becoming for collecting data on users and if you have any examples. So I think it all depends. I, I don't wanna go into the realm of big brother, but allowing folks the option to opt in to receive certain information. Um, I think that's very popular and very important. We've been looking at some um, geo-enrichment data and geofencing data for, we were talking about it this morning when folks are at parks, how do you get out an important message? Say there's an evacuation due to weather. How do you reach all those people other than running from campsite to campsite where you could have more time to be reactive and maybe keep some people safe if you can just hit their cell phones with a ping with a text saying you need to evacuate near a shelter is here. Um, but then there's also the opportunity for marketing through mobile apps. Give them the opportunity to opt in. Do you want to learn more about uh, some of the activities going on at Farm Island? We have an intro to archery class going on the weekend while you're there. Come over to the archery range and sign up or watch or whatever it may be. Scott? Yeah, I, I think that uh, mobile apps are, are, are an important tool and, and they are something that we haven't taken advantage of on the park side. Um, I would tell you that, in fact, we've done a terrible job of uh, capturing data um, on our users and uh, it's really hamstrung us in our communication efforts back to them. So I guess I would say that I, I, I'm not so concerned about mobile apps. I think they're gonna play a role for us moving forward. Um, but I think in general, uh, capturing additional information, personal information from our users and being able to cross those lines between wildlife and parks to start communicating with those folks, uh, I, I think that's going to be a powerful tool. I, I think, uh, uh, you know, we, we've seen it on a lot of different platforms that capturing who your customers are, being able to go back out and say, hey, here's opportunities. Uh, or, or ask them questions about use or, uh, you know, just get their input on how things are going. Um, it, it's a really powerful tool. And we have, GFP has barely scratched the surface on this and we really need to do a better job in, in, in park specifically. I, I'm not, you know, I don't want to drag wildlife into this because I think we've made a lot of uh, um, improvements over there with just, just with emails. Um, although that's becoming less and less of a, an effective tool, but um, yeah, we, we really need to do a better job on the park side of, of capturing information, regardless of what that platform is, and begin to communicate back with our folks. And uh, there's lots of interesting ways to do that. And uh, I am certainly no techie, as many of you know, but uh, I, I'm, in, I'm interested in the idea. And, uh, you know, I think uh, some of the things that we've got moving forward are going to help us do that. Great. Um, we had another question uh, typed in from Hillary. She's wondering if there are any plans or ways to share information and targeted marketing with other states. For example, if we see increased use in non-resident licenses or camping reservations, how can we help other states capitalize on that with their own programs at home to keep people engaged from one season to the next? Yeah, we, just, just, we just talked about this this morning. Um, so Brandt, who is our vendor, uh, will be our vendor moving forward uh, for both of our wildlife licensing and parks. They have a, a, a group that they have together of all their customers that allows a, 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 or provides a platform for those folks to share ideas, whether they be marketing ideas or, or uh, new programs or, or what have you. And, uh, you know, th that just starts to build that conversation about sharing, hey, this worked, this didn't work. Um, we don't need to be on an island by ourselves at South Dakota and say, hey, you know, let, let's throw this out there and see if it works. And, uh, you know, and then you know, we move on to the next thing. Uh, I, there's actually an idea, idea sharing group there that I, I think is really going to be beneficial. I know we had 
folks that were excited to get on and uh, to that program right away this morning when we were talking about it. So um, that's that's one instance. I think we've got some of those trade organizations, whether it be RBFF uh, or others that are like that, that uh, facilitate some of that conversation where we can share best practices. And, uh, you know, I, I, I see that moving forward and, and just getting uh, more and more mature, more and more advanced and, and allowing us to, to share some of those ideas across platforms. Um, every state's got their idea of what they think is right and wrong. Um, but a lot of times we can we can pick up some things uh, over time and, and make ourselves better. Um, uh, one of my I, I, I tell people I haven't had an original thought in 17 years worth of working at the game fishing parks. All I do is steal other other people's ideas and and try to make them my own. And uh, it, it, it's been, it's worked so far, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it definitely doesn't mean we have to reinvent the wheel every time out. Yeah, the highest form of flattery in state government is plagiarism. <laughs> Great. Um, any other questions? No, but just to expand on, you know, what Scott said, uh, when I speak of, of plagiarism on stealing from other agencies, their ideas, not reinventing the wheel, that's another bonus of going with the vendor that we have chosen, Brandt, is if they develop something for another state, it's an option for us automatically, they just have to turn it off or on. So it's really a collaborative environment beyond just us and the vendor. There's right now, I think seven or eight other states involved, um, Iowa, Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, Idaho, and I think a few others in between. So we have a lot of opportunity here and we're really gonna hopefully make some big strides and do some really great stuff. Great, yeah, that's exciting stuff. I'm pretty excited to see what you guys pull together. Any other questions or anything you guys want to conclude with here? I, I'd just say, Casey, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak with everyone. Like I said, it took me 17 years to get an invite. 15 <laughs> so, uh, Better late than never, I guess. Yeah. And so good Good to see some of the names uh, on the screen. Uh, there's a couple of you I, I know that I, uh, I don't reach out to as much as I should have, and I apologize for that. But uh, Good, good to see everyone again, and uh, really thanks for your time, and i um, looking forward to uh, next year. If there's something I can offer, I'd be more than happy to come back. Absolutely, and thank you both for jumping on. I know how busy your schedules are, so we sure appreciate it. And you both did a great job at getting us caught back up on time, so <laughs> such an interesting talk. We had plenty of questions. So, um,